Jefferson and some, some of them two or three times, so that's okay. You know, I don't read very well. Matter of fact, I was thinking about it this morning as I was brushing my tooth. In the, in the funny papers there a day or two ago, you know, I like uh, yeah, Loretta and Leroy. Loretta and Leroy are my favorite ones. But anyway, Loretta had been out shopping. She got back to the house and she went in the house. Lo and behold, there's Leroy laying right in the middle of the floor. And uh, he said, or she said, Leroy, Leroy, are you all right? And he said, I've fallen, but I don't want to get up. <laughs> 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 hey, thank you, my big overalls. Me and old John. John had a nerve to wear his. And you're going to see a preacher up here directly preaching with big overalls on. So, I've heard of that, but I don't know if I ever seen it. Huh? Oh, yeah, Rhonda says that's a hillbilly tuxedo. So, all right. Yeah. All right. Number 58, the, the old country church.
before Jesus was born in Bethlehem, there was a prophet in the Levant or the Middle East in the Promised Land who was named Isaiah. 600 years before Jesus was born, Isaiah began to tell the prophecy. The fore, he foretold, foretold that Jesus was going to be born. Told a lot about him. His birth, his death, his resurrection. Uh, just so much that he would talk about it. But what you need to understand is that was 600 years before Jesus was born. This thing called prophecy is, is foretelling. I mean, in some ways... This morning I am a prophet in that I am foretelling. Uh, I am not doing so much foretelling. In other words, I'm making no predictions about the future. But uh, prophecy foretells and foretells. And, and Isaiah was a foreteller. He was a seer. Uh, he, uh, he heard from God and he spoke God's word to the people. He told about Jesus a long time. Now we are so used to that. We've so long heard this story of Isaiah's prophecies that it's not a really big thing for us, but you need to truly catch the truth here. This is prophecy. And whenever we dig into it, your your heart is going to be warmed. You're going to you're going to feel this morning a, a, an inner joy that begins to, to stir up inside you when we read the prophetic words of a of a of an ancient Jew prophet by the name of Isaiah. He talks about the sovereignty of God. Last Thursday evening, I preached an entire sermon on the sovereignty of God. And we figured out exactly why God did some of the things He did. Because He wanted to. That's sovereignty. He can do whatever He wants to do. And He used a pagan by the name of Cyrus to bring His people from bondage. Why did He choose Cyrus? Why did He choose a Zoroastrian by the name of Cyrus? Why did He pick him to set the people free because he wanted to. That's the sovereignty of God. He doesn't account to anyone. I have to account to my wife, to my family, to you. I'm accountable and you're accountable. But God doesn't have to account to anyone. He gets his sovereign. <clears throat> Isaiah was one of the greatest prophets in the Bible. He is called a major prophet in that he wrote a major document. In other words, it's a big one. The minor prophets are called minor prophets because they wrote little prophecies. Just as powerful, just as truthful, just as important. But Isaiah's is longer and bigger, therefore he's called a major prophet. Today we're going to begin in the Isaiah chapter 53, probably, in my opinion, his greatest work, Isaiah 53. I think this is where he exceeded himself and uh, did, uh, did the best job he did anywhere in any of his writings in Isaiah chapter 53. Yahweh, Jehovah God, speaks through Isaiah. And what, he, what he's telling him here in this portion of Isaiah uh, is that he is summarizing the reason for the Babylonian captivity. He's trying to explain to Isaiah why the Jews had to go into captivity. And, and I want to just for a moment use it as a preaching point to tell you that there is a reason for what God does in our lives. <clears throat> Sometimes we go into a captivity ourselves. Sometimes we go through dark valleys and deep depressions and, and disappointments. But there's a perfect reason for it because we know that in all things God works together for them to love the Lord. It's good what God's doing in your life. It may not seem like it. It may hurt like heck. And you may scream and kick and, and want out of it. But what God's doing is sovereign. He knows what He's doing. He's on perfect. He's on time. He's on budget. He's, a, he's doing what He wants to do. In Isaiah chapter 53, verse 1, we read these words. Who has believed our message? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? Now, what Isaiah is doing here, and this is sort of technical, theological stuff, but just for briefly, I want you to have it sort of in your background. It will help you understand prophecy. It will help you understand what's going on. Isaiah is preaching about a situation that can be interpreted in four different ways. Four different ways. 
there, he's talking about somebody, number one, a human being who lived during the time of Isaiah. This man, we don't know who he is. He's never mentioned. He's never given a name. Was, he, he is the, the prima facie the person that Isaiah is speaking about, this first person. He could also be talking about the Jewish nation because they were the servant of God. They were the suffering servant. And I think primarily he's talking about the third interpretation, which is Jesus the Messiah. And that's the one I look back. We look back after 2,500 years. Well, 2,100 years. We look back to the life of Jesus and we say, oh yeah, that's who he's talking about because he's done such a perfect job of describing him. But there's even one more. There's one more interpretation. And that is you and I are the suffering servant. We are Jesus' hands in this world today. We are his feet. We are his voice. We are his resource in this world today. And so we, all four of us, can be interpreted into this text today. But that's just, that's a giveaway. I want you just to fold that away. We're going to now have to take it to the one that I prefer, that I think it's primarily speaking about, and that is Jesus the Messiah. <clears throat> Originally, um, this was, this story is a story that we're going to find completely describing the Jesus described in the New Testament. This is going to define him. As we read Isaiah's description of the Messiah, we're going to find true brilliance into this insight. We're going to stand back and say, wow, did he nail it? Was he right on in prophecy? You know, sometimes prophecies are vague and, and you've read of Nostradamus and, and you've heard of other the, the weird prophecies and they'll be, you know, 20% right and whatever. But Isaiah nails it right on 100%. Uh, Isaiah is going to tell us about the Messiah and he's going to summarize and explain to us about this text. And he says that captivity came for a reason. I talked about that earlier. Captivity comes for a reason. It wasn't just a, an accident. It wasn't just a, 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 something that happened in that culture or because one nation got stronger and they wanted to go to war. It was not for accident or it was on purpose. God did it. And... Uh, they, they learned something from the captivity. You may not even be aware of this, but when the Jewish people were approaching this time, about 2,600 years ago, when they were coming into this time, they had slid back so far from their true faith. They were back into a technical term called Henotheism, which simply means they believed in Jehovah God, but they also had other gods along with it. He was the primary God, Jehovah, but they worshipped the other gods too. And their houses were filled with, with idols. They picked up idolatry from the Canaanites, the Jebusites, the, the you know, the Mennonites, not the Mennonites, I mean. <laughs> and they had picked up they picked up a lot of uh, I just want to see if he's awake, you know. They picked up a lot of this stuff, see, and they were they were using it in their lives and uh, it was drawing them away from God. It was causing horrible problems in their lives. And it was degrading life. It was degrading family. Without going into all kinds of gory detail, uh, we need to be aware that idolatry will always drag you down. Idolatry will, will hurt you and, and make your life less. And you'll be thinking, I'm not idolatrous. Well... No, you're not idolatrous, but you're henotheistic. That means you believe in God, but you've got other little gods around. You, you don't even maybe recognize them, but you got them. If we're not careful, we'll, we'll our wives, our children, our car, our recreation, our farms, or something, we'll get to putting a lot of power there and, and we'll give it too much credit. Anyway, without, that's not my story, but I want you to know that this is describing uh, the situation that was going on in Jerusalem. Now, God is in the process of revealing himself to you and to me and to the world. He wants us to know him, and so he, he un unveils, he uh, uh, pulls back the curtain. He, uh, 
That's what we call apocalypsis. He opens up and lets us see who he is. He pulls back the curtain. That's what the book of Revelation talks about, is that it's an unveiling, an apocalypse. He unveils. And God is in the process of doing that. Now listen closely as Isaiah does a marvelous job unveiling Jesus, because he's going to talk about his birth. 600 years before it happened. He's going to talk about his life, his death, the form of death that he took, and the resurrection. He's going to talk about all of those things. This is about uh, this person, but we're going to see he's really talking about Jesus. But how does Isaiah portray him? How does he, what does he use to describe it? Now, my outline, when I went through this, and I put it in this form of an outline, the first thing he's going to tell us about the Messiah is that he was not like a modern politician who has to look good on TV. Do you, you, you realize today that you would never get elected to any kind of major office if you didn't look good? Or if you didn't have a lot of money? Or you weren't attracted? Certain people have got to be attracted to you even in a physical way. We, today we have our favorite actresses and actors and we have our favorite this and that. And primarily it's that we're attracted to their physical presence. Their beauty draws us uh, to them and to, them to us. And that's, you know, that's, I know that's why you come to Calvary Church, because of my beauty. It just, uh, <laughs> thank you, thank you. <laughs> no, I have no problem with my ego in that regard. But the point I want to make is, we don't, we're not, we're not attracted to Jesus because of his physical presence. physical presence. Let's read verse 2. He grew up before him like a tender shoot, like a root out of dry ground. He had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him. Nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. Now, don't misinterpret that by saying Jesus was ugly or, or, or not Beautiful. Doesn't say that at all. He just says that's why we weren't attracted to that part of him. Uh, now notice how he describes him. He says he was like a tender shoot coming up out of the dry ground. I I love the garden. I love the woods and the, the forests and nature. And, and when spring, the warm finally replaces the frost and the snow and the, the cold winds. You'll be looking out on the south edge of one of my shops, or out in front of my shop, and, and there'll be a crocus popping its little head up way early, maybe even in the snow. There'll be this little crocus popping its little head up like a tender shoot out of dry, barren ground. Out it will come. And what this is telling us is that Jesus didn't make a big splash when he was born. He didn't come on the scene with trumpets or with announcements or TV <laughs> media coverage. He came quite quietly, suddenly, and appeared uh, in the world as a tender shoot at a dry ground. And then, of course, we weren't attracted to his beauty, but we were attracted to his inner beauty. Now, Jesus came, and his message was the, a message of the kingdom of God. He, he came to tell us about this idealized, perfect kingdom where God is king, where he's boss, he's sovereign. And what he's teaching us is if you and I will move into that kingdom and let God be king, by the way, that's how you get become part of the kingdom. You make him king. Subtle and simple, but it's true. But if you move into the kingdom, then your life takes on a different Hum, a different vibration, a different beauty as we follow through the kingdom of God. Let's read verse 3 because we're going to talk about, he's going to talk to us now about the, uh, a, part, a part of something we didn't understand. Before I read verse 3, I want to say it like this. Jesus didn't come to make a better Judaism. A lot of people think he came to, to correct, fix, you know, tweak Judaism to make it better. He did not come to make Judaism better. He didn't come to start a religion. He didn't come to enhance religion. He came to talk to us about a relationship between the king and, and us. He talked about being friends, of being, uh, we're going to talk in a moment about being grafted 
into a new family, a new, a new way of being. He came to talk us about that. He did not come to do religion. And a lot of folks think that. And Isaiah comes to that, gets clear about that, when he says there wasn't anything in him to attract us to him. He, it was inner. It was the relationship, was beauty. Now listen to verse 3. He was despised and rejected by mankind. A man of suffering and familiar with pain. Like one from whom people hide their faces, he was despised and we held him in low esteem. Now that, that coming to earth and not being religious or promoting a religion got him into trouble. People are funny like that, aren't they? I mean, we, you know, if the, if the preacher wears a pair of overalls to church, we think it's weird or a joke. Of course, you're not here in the Cowboy Church. We don't, we don't care what you direct, wear just as long as you wear something, right? <laughs> but we are, we are religious. We hang on to our traditions and our doctrines. And Jesus came not talking about bettering Judaism. He talked about making a better man and woman. Making us better. But it got him into trouble with the Jewish elite who were loving their playhouse that they made in Judaism. The place that they had come to, the, the positions they got to hold. They got to be the high paid holy men in, the, in Judaism and they liked it and they did not want to give up on that. And they got mad at Jesus when he came, not, in, not lifting them up further, but lifting up the kingdom of God. And it put his life on a collision course. When he started talking about this, I mean, he was picking a fight. And he was headed for the cliff. Something was going to happen. Because these Jews, Jewish elite, they would not put up with this. Because he was offending them, offending their positions, their theology. He was offending them. And they were going to come to a head collision with him eventually. And so Jesus was all about that. But here's the thing you got to get. Jesus didn't come to avoid death. He came to die. Are you aware of that? That was his reason for coming here. Some people think, oh, he came, the reason Jesus came was to teach. Yeah, he did teach, but that wasn't his primary mission. His prime directive was not to teach. His prime directive was to die for the sins of the world. To be a substitute sacrifice. For the sin of the world. That's why he came. So death was brutal and ugly. Oh, it was brutal and ugly. Let's read verse 3. He was despised and rejected by mankind, a man of suffering, familiar with pain, like one from whom people hide their faces. He was despised and we held him in low esteem. Now, the death on the cross was brutal, it was ugly. And people would hide their faces from it. You wouldn't want to look at it. I mean, you'd see it and it'd just be so horrible. It, it, it's like today, once in a while, on a video or somewhere, they'll show an execution of a, of a ISIS will execute somebody. Or some World War I or World War II, God will shoot another guy in the back of the head. And you get to see it on TV. And when that happens, I always go, oh, I turn my face from it. My heart just sinks because it, it offends me. It, it uh, hurts me. It brutalizes me. And that's what it says that people, they saw that and they turned their face from him because they didn't want to see the horrid death that he was dying because it was brutal and it was ugly. The Jewish leadership today did not ex didn't understand who he was and uh, they didn't know he, that he was God. But eventually, um, people began to pick up and understand who he was. Many people, you know, are drawn to Elvis Presley because he's good looking and, and you know, we're drawn. But, but the reason we were drawn to Jesus was his beauty was on the inside. Now, if you are, are tired of living your life being attracted to ugliness and, and horror and sin and, and that all the things of life that bring us down, if you're tired of that, I'm telling you, you don't have to live that way. You can come to Jesus. You can open up your life to the beauty, the grace, the inner perfectness of Him and let that transfer to your life and become yours. The second thing I want to tell you today about Jesus is that everything He did was a substitute or selfless. It was a sacrifice. 
Now, I grew up in, with a bunch of boys. I have three brothers. And I want to tell you something. I never did one time in my entire life. Never. And that was when Dad was going to spank one of my brothers. I never did step up and say, no, Dad, spank me instead. <laughs> that never happened. In fact, I stood back and said, yeah. <laughs> I didn't sacrifice. I didn't substitute. I didn't step in. And I bet you didn't either, right? Come on. You honorary people. I know you. I see you. But what Jesus did was he totally substituted and sacrificed in his life for others. He, he lived and he died entirely for the benefit of others. It was not for him. It wasn't about him. It was for you and for me. Oh, yes. And you know what I say to that? Wow. That's just so different than anybody else ever did. Let's read verse 4. Surely he took up our pain and bore our suffering, yet we considered him punished by God. In other words, we said, yeah, God, pour it on him, God. God's just punishing him. And they keep going, stricken by him and afflicted, verse 5. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. And the punishment that brought us peace was on him. And by his wounds we are healed. Oh, yes. <clears throat> I took a course one time that explained to me salvation. And I, I and it has impacted me because I'm a very visual person. I, I when I, I I need to visualize it to see it, to truly understand it or comprehend it. And I'm going to lay my microphone down and visualize for you how this works. And I'm going to take one of my hands and I'm going to hold it out like this. And in my hand, I want, to, I want you to put everything you've ever done wrong. Every sin, every bad thought, every bad action, every dumb decision, everything you've ever done wrong in your life. And I want you to lay it in my hand. Ready? Okay, there it is. And I'm going to visualize what I'm going to show you. Because the other hand I'm going to hold out here is going to be Jesus. All right? Perfect, sinless, not any, no smell on him, no sin in him, nothing. Perfect. And I want you to... Here's you. Here's Jesus. And he died on for it on the cross. Oh, yeah. That's just simple stuff to me, but it spoke so deeply to me. It, I visualized. He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. What does that mean by pierced? How can he pick out that word? Why in prophecy did he pick out the word pierced? Do you remember when Jesus was dying late in the day on preparation day for Passover? They didn't want to leave the, the criminals on the cross past sundown because that was prep day for Sabbath. So they would hasten and hurry up to death of the criminals. And to do that, they went around and broke the legs. They broke the leg of the guy down on the left and they broke the legs of the guy down on the right. Why did they break their legs? Because when they broke their legs, they couldn't breathe. He said, what? Because you had to push up to get a breath when you're hanging on a cross. You had to push up. And when your legs are broken, you can't push up. So they died quickly. When they came to Jesus, they were going to break his legs. But they didn't. You know why? They didn't have to. He was already dead. He was already, he'd already stopped breathing. He had willed himself dead. He said, into thy hands I commend my spirit. And he willed himself dead. And he, and he left his body there on the cross and went home to be with the Lord. So instead of breaking Jesus' legs, by the way, he was the perfect sacrifice. And if he had broken legs... He wouldn't have been a perfect sacrifice. I know that's splitting hairs, but it's interesting. And so instead of breaking his legs, what did they did? They drove a spear into his heart. They literally took a spear and pushed it up through his ribs, up into his heart. Now, I'm not a doctor or a nurse, but I got a feeling that'd kill you every time. <laughs> wouldn't it? I think that'd be all. When you had a spear stuck in your heart, that's all. Your heart's not going to beat much longer. But Jesus was already dead, as I said. But he was pierced 
He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. What do you mean by crushed? How was he crushed? When, he, when they put him down on the cross, they crushed him down on the cross, held him on the cross, pushed him there, and nailed him there. He was crushed. He was pierced. He was wounded. And his wounds healed us. His, his death saved us. Verse 6 says, We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to our own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. See, Isaiah spoke that truth, didn't he? He said that was God's plan, and he meant all of us. Uh, those of you who don't fit into that category that really have done a really good job and never sinned, would you go ahead and raise your hand? I want to see all the liars here and see people. No, we're all sinners, aren't we? Yeah, we all are. And therefore God has put upon all of us. We're all sinners, and all of our sin. Uh, he loves us. Now I want to say this to you because you need to hear this. Even if you'd raise your hand and lied to God right then, you know what? He would still love you. <laughs> That's the kind of God He is. Because he loves sinners. He loves liars. He forgives us. And that's such good news for a person like me. I need to know God loves me even though I'm not perfect. Now, all we like sheep have gone astray. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. I could, if I had enough time, and, and I don't want to keep you here because you're getting hungry. But if I had time, I'd take you back to Noah. And, and Adam and sin, the sin of Adam. And that bring you to Noah. And that bring you up through uh, the, the restart that God gave us after Noah. And, and talk about how sin came into our lives and how we joined in with the rebel angels and we joined that war that was going on in, in heaven. And we joined in. But in all that, God still loved us. All of us like sheep have rebelled against God. <clears throat> He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before his its shearers is silent. So he did not open his mouth. Now, if that had been me, I would have screamed foul the whole way through. I would have said, wait a minute, you got the wrong guy. I'm the perfect one. But kill anybody else, not me. I'm the I'm God's son. I'm perfect. I've never sinned. You, you don't need to kill me. But, but Jesus did. He was silent. And it says there, um, it says there uh, in verse 8, by oppression and judgment he was taken away. Yet who of his generation protested? Who in his generation protested it? Who said something? Nobody. For he was cut off from the land of the, of the living. Nobody said a word. Jesus didn't say a word. No rabbi stood up and said, no, you got the wrong guy. No prophet stood up and said it. No one. Why is that? I'm going to close with this. Here's why nobody said anything. Abraham had a boy named Isaac. And Abraham was told by God to take Isaac up to Jerusalem, Mount Moriah, which is Jerusalem, which in my way of thinking was even where the cross was held, but that's not proven. But God said, take, take him up there and I want you to sacrifice him. When I actually got him up there and he started to drive that flint knife into the boy's heart, God said, whoa, stop. And he substituted a lamb, a ram, a, a, a sheep for the boy. And he said, no, you kill the lamb as a substitute and you, you and the boy go back to your mother. Stop, I'm going to bring a substitute. And you know, we're all thinking, all right, as we collectively <coughs> think about this, and we would expect, had we been there, that on the cross, there's Jesus about to be crucified. The spear is about to be driven into his heart. And we would expect God to say, whoa, stop. But he didn't. Why is that? Because Jesus is the substitute. He was the lamb, the ram caught in the bushes. He was the substitute. I am a child of Adam. I was born in Adam's line. I am genetically Adam's son I'm in that line. But when I was a young man, I accepted a, an agreement that God made with me. And he makes with everybody. He said, if you will, I will cut you off 
from Adam's line, and I'll graft you into the second Adam's line. Jesus is the second Adam. He's the second Adam. And I was born again. I was born the first time in old Adam's line. And I was born again into Jesus' line. Therefore, I'm a child of the King. Oh, yes. And so are you. If you'd like to have that experience in your life and, and know Christ and be born again, be uh, God's voice in this world, His hands, His feet, if you'd like to have Christ in your life, this is the day you can do that. You say, how do I do it? It's an act of will. You stop choosing to stay in Adam's line and let God cut you off and put you off, change you and give you a new birth experience. Put you over in the second Adam's line. And then you'll become a part of the family of God forever. You can do that. How do I do it? By simply an act of the will. But in prayer, with faith, accept the grace of God and the substitute. Number 52 in your songbook.